one who has not done any politics but understands that word very well, John Lipsky. He has made most of his career as a chief economist in the banking industry and at the IMF. <coughs> The word crisis, sorry, the word crisis more than rings a bell to him. During his last tenure at the IMF, where he was deputy director, he held the interim for Dominique Strauss-Kahn, and at that time, he had to tackle the consequences of the 2008 financial crisis, the European and especially the Greek debt crisis, including, including the one his own institution was going through. He has been looking ever since for those black swans these unpredictable events that can topple the world economy. And his positive observation is now at John Hopkins University at the very famous School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, Mario Monti is with us today also. He is one of the better known political figures in Europe. He has had the courage to accept the responsibility of leading Italy's government at the heart of the debt crisis mm -hmm. and attempted difficult reforms. A true European builder, he has been twice commissioner, once in charge of internal affairs and the other one of competition. He's famously known for imposing a $500 million fine to Microsoft, and at the time it was a first, and for that he earned the nickname Super Mario. And uh, trained at the famous Boccoli University as well as Yale, he has also presided the Milanese University for several years. Uh, Mr. Moto, I'm going to try to say that right. <laughs> Motogishi Ito is a Japanese academic uh, who has been involved as a top counselor to various government committees and is also an advisor to the Bank of Japan. Uh, he is the president of the National Institute for Research Advancement and a professor at the, at the Graduate School of Economics at the University of Tokyo. It is fair to say that he has the ear of Prime Minister Chinzo Abe. Abenomics have no mystery for him, and he has written extensively, even published a book about what the economic crisis had brought to the world. And finally, Mr. Sakong is also an economist who, as Mario Monti, has had his hands on economic policy within a government. Most famously, he was uh, the Minister of Finance from 1983 to 1987. He has been involved with many, many multilateral institutions, such as the IMF and the G20. He has lot, done a lot to improve South Korea's competitivity, with clearly some success, is a great scholar on international finance and trade policy issues. So the topic of this round table is very fitting. Six years after the financial crisis that started on Wall Street, we're still painfully emerging from its aftermath. We understand that we're getting now into new paradigms, but the uncertainty is so high on so many levels that it is hard at this crossroad to find the right direction. World growth has almost never been that slow, a little or under 3% this year. Worldwide trade is actually very weak. The Chinese economic slowdown has an impact on everyone else. There is a fear, a very real fear, that as soon as the Fed will tighten its monetary policy, most of the emerging countries will go under. Even the Fed, in a recent statement, said it was important for her to monitor the international situation as sudden dangerous events can sidetrack the American economy, doing for now notably better. Europe is indeed facing a huge crisis with about 1.5 million refugees crossing over its borders. Terrorism is striking hard, and the Syrian conflict is very much unresolved. At the same time, we see new organizations coming to light. China is successful in setting up new banks to rival with older institutions, such as the IMF or the World Bank. Some major trade agreements are signed or are in discussion, sometimes painfully. OECD countries unite to fight against fiscal optimization, and states believe that economies can be rejuvenated while fighting against climate change. So yes, indeed, we are at a crossroad, and one of the questions is that in the light of the new dangers facing our world, is our global government ad adequate? So economics are going to be a big part of this conference. As you know, uh, as Thierry explained earlier, that he's a strong promoter of geoeconomics. Uh, you will also be able to attend sessions on how the job of a central banker has changed. And I'm sure there's a lot to say for that. What is the significance of trade agreements to medium powers? Or what nationality means today to an enterprise? The format of this roundtable is going to be the following. I'm going to ask a question to each of our panelists, and he'll have about five to seven minutes to, to answer back. 
Then we'll have about a quarter of an hour to discuss some topics. Well, they will have time to discuss among themselves. And after that, we'll have 20 to 25 minutes to open to the floor. So back to our topic, uh, the economic order at crossroads. Uh, we see how striking it has been to see how international governments has evolved over the last year. And I'd like to start with you, Mr. Lipsky. Uh, we all of us remember September 2008 when the, when the world was really on the brink of financial collapsing. And can you remind us how much this has changed governance? And can you assess where we are today and how efficient our system and trustworthy is? Thank, thank you, you very much. And uh, thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, your question's, a, a, I think, a very pertinent one. I, I would say my, my main point in response would be that following the global financial crisis, one unexpected result has been the diminished focus on and uh, a reduced role of the multilateral and treaty-based institutions that formed the foundation of the post-World War II uh, economic and financial uh, architecture. And instead, there's been a, a rising role of what I would call ad hoc, voluntary, and regional initiatives. And to my mind, this has added to the sense of unease, uncertainty, and unpredictability of policies that has, uh, I think, uh, made the recovery more difficult. I suspect that this period of uncertainty about policy direction and policy organization won't be resolved quickly, and certainly not until there's a greater sense of shared economic progress and diminished sense of frustration with weak economic performance, especially in the EU and in uh, Japan, and a greater sense of regional rebalancing that will be taking place over the next few years in, in Asia. Uh, more broadly, if I could, uh, to expand on this, just to remind that the, uh, since the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, there was a filling out of the uh, uh, multilateral institutions that were the, the uh, basic architecture of the post-World War II era on trade, that's the GATT, and subsequently the WTO, on global financial issues, the IMF. And of course, one of the ambiguities of that system was there was no formal role for any institution with regards to global capital flows, which uh, the IMF uh, was not empowered uh, to, uh, to oversee. Now, despite the, uh, the sense of looking back of great moderation of the period of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, in fact, there were repeated crises, 94, 95, Mexico, 97, 98, Asia, Russia, Brazil, et cetera. And uh, in response, to, or in the wake of the Asian crisis, there was a new institution created, the Financial Stability Forum, that was designed exactly to take many of these financial regulatory issues out of the IMF and in a smaller voluntary body. 2000, we had the dot-com crisis, and of course then the global financial crisis. The principal uh, institutional response to that, to the global financial crisis, was the formation of the G20 at a leader's level. And they ad adopted four principal agenda items at their initial meeting. One, to restore global growth. Two, to repair and reform the financial system. Three, to avoid protection and promote new trade liberalization. And four, to reform the international financial institutions, specifically the IMF and they assigned specific uh, they, uh, or institutions or organizations were either formed or assigned these responsibilities. In the case of growth, it was a so-called framework for strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. Now, uh, the, all of these had uh, good intentions, but the institutional ambiguity was that they are all voluntary. The G20 is not a universal institution. It's uh, self-appointed. Uh, and it's not treaty-based, and therefore its pronouncements, although very powerful, uh, don't have the same standing as a decision of a multilateral institution. Surprising, well, I don't know if it's surprising, but when we look back, we realize that uh, uh, from these four agenda items, not one of them could be considered to have been accomplished uh, despite the time that has passed since 2008. Not necessarily a criticism, but just a, a statement of fact. But I do think that this operation of, of this ad hoc uh, G20-led system has tended to undermine the effectiveness 
and legitimacy of the post-World War II organizations. Uh, the G20 summit just passed only a, a, a few days ago, and uh, I suspect hardly anyone noticed that the, any discussions outside of the political discussions out, around, uh, around Syria. Uh, in fact, the framework uh, produced something called the Anatolia Action Plan. I'll bet hardly anyone has taken a look at that. Uh, the Financial Stability Board that was created as a successor to the Financial Stability Forum uh, has been promoting reform that was intended to create a level playing field, but in fact, I suspect that it has, I think most people would conclude that com compared to before the crisis, financial markets are more nationalized. Our, uh, the playing field, if anything, is less e even than it was previously. With regard to trade, the initial uh, commitment to adopt Doha or to finalize the Doha arrangements have been uh, uh, instead uh, replaced by regional trade uh, initiatives. And with regard to IFI reforms, the, Seoul, the, the reforms agreed for the IMF in Seoul remain uh, still to be uh, adopted by the, uh, by the US Congress, and it looks like that uh, it's quite likely will not happen under this Congress. As a result, for the IMF, it's a, it may, we may have to renegotiate the sole reforms under a new US, U.S. presidency. And trade, there's still great uncertainty about exactly how this is going to happen. Big point, the old system is being uh, superseded without a completely clear vision of what's happening next. The, of course, a test for the possibility of broad multilateral action is going to be the COP21 discussions in Paris. We'll be watching closely. But I think there's a real challenge here that was not clearly anticipated in the wake of the financial crisis. I have to say it's really, it's really interesting. Um, I hope you hear me. Um, but I wonder, um, we understand that the G20 took power because it was in the heat of the action. The crisis was so bad, all governments decided to join together and did take some decisions and affirm some principles, as you say. But do you think they were actually lacking legitimacy today? Is that, is that the problem? Or is that that they're not effective enough by themselves? I mean, the G20 is not powerful enough. The G20, as it's constituted, is uh, potentially extremely powerful as, uh, as the expression of a consensus. Mm -hmm. What it has trouble dealing with because of its, of its lack of an internal structure, and to a certain degree because a lack of legitimacy is, sounds sort of loaded, but that it's a voluntary partial group, even though hugely, hugely important. Uh, remember, the initial idea was to bolster both cooperation and the effectiveness of the pre-existing institutions. And uh, I would say that part of the, part of the problem, if you want to go into more detail, is in part that there's a disjoint between, or disjunction between the membership of the G20 and the leadership of the multilateral institutions in the sense that their executive boards are not the same as the, as the G20 membership. Right. So it's, a, it's tended to confuse the system, and when there's lack of consensus among the G20, especially among the principal members of the G20, then the G20 finds it very hard to make progress, mm -hmm. whereas the multilateral institutions have a voting rule and a legitimacy through its, through its uh, universal nature that uh, allows them to reach decisions that have legitimacy and legal standing even when there's not full consensus. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, they have uh, not lost credibility, but they, they've been very much criticized. I mean, I think of the IMF, uh, the World Bank, the Greek crisis, for instance, has been, you know, I mean, showed that very clearly. There was really a lot of angst and anger against the Troika, for instance. So it's, I mean, I understand that they probably have the structures to and to make things more abiding, um, but but their their message is maybe less accepted too. Well, I don't know. You know, if you take on tough situations, your <laughs> criticism is going to be inevitable. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to like everything you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's, that's part of, the, of how the usefulness of these institutions, that their very structure mm -hmm. means that they can take action in context in which there is not complete consensus. So we should wish for 
uh, a comeback of those multilateral institutions, for them to, to come back and take more preeminence? It strikes me that there, is, is, there are grounds for a rethinking mm -hmm. of, the, of the current structure to try to line up better the ad hoc and uh, right. uh, voluntary uh, organizations with the underlying architecture. Mm -hmm. And certainly there is a, a, some important questions that we'll be dealing with uh, uh, as things develop. It's not inappropriate that there, are de that there is a filling out of regional uh, uh, regional institutions, but they need to be consistent with the actions at a global level. I'd like to turn now to you, Mr. Sakong, because you've been one of the Sherpas of the G20. Did you feel that there is that need of reform, of better alignment, as Mr. Lipsky was just mentioning? Well, I think uh, this issue should be put in a wider historical perspective uh, in terms of global governance system. As uh, you know, we all know, the post-World War II world uh, economic order uh, was based on the institutional setup of the uh, GATT, WTO now, and Britain was uh, institutions. And U.S. played the key role, the leading role in establishing these institutions and the keeping the world order. An important thing is that U.S. Had, has had both economic affordability and incentives, both economic and security related incentives. Sometimes U.S. was willing to pay what is called, economists call side payments to member countries to abide by these international rules. Marshall Plan and Dutch Plan are examples. And then came the 1970s and 1980s when U.S. domestic economic situation and the global economic power constellation changed. So the world changed from unipolar world to multipolar or now is a no polar world, okay? So a decision making for the global community as a whole is very difficult. Previously, as a, there was ad hoc, and then John mentioned ad hoc arrangements, Plaza Accord, Louvre Accord in 1985 and 1987, which is five and G7. But now, after 28, uh, 27, 28 global crisis, the G7 leaders included, G global leaders thought that it's not legitimate enough, credit, credit not, representative enough. So they decided to have G20. G20 is not meant to be formal institutions for uh, global. It was informal, so to speak, a steering committee for the world. Because unlike under the unipolar world, there is no leadership force coming. So the leaders thought that it's a collective leadership is necessary. And so G20 became the forum for the uh, collective leadership. And then, as John just uh, pointed out, lead, in my view, and uh, I agree with it, John, it's not living up to the, uh, uh, the original task. But in any case, G20 is not to replace uh, formal institutions. It is an informal steering committee because today, look at the Bretton Woods institutions. Look at the quota distribution and the voice distribution does not reflect the current constellation of uh, uh, glo global economic power. So to make these institutions more legitimate and credible, you have to reflect current world economic con the power. So the G20 leaders in Seoul 2010, uh, the, the uh, agreed to substantially deform uh, the Britain institutions, particularly IMF, by sh shifting, which is historical, 6% of quota from overrepresented to underrepresented uh, countries. But now it's told by the US Congress uh, uh, the uh, 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 you know, disapproval of the US administration's proposal. So this is where we are now. And I think uh, what we need is that we have to 
make G20 as a collective leadership forum uh, the workable. Otherwise, we just know, you know the uh, leadership force coming. The world needs public goods, global public goods, financial stability, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, free trade regime. But uh, the leadership is not forthcoming. That's why I think this G20's role is very, very important. And I've been attending this forum from the, the initial meeting in Evian. I've been mean, keep saying that this is the, the task, the challenge the global community has. And uh, it's not happening. And so, uh, so important thing is that G20 should work closely with you know, IMF and existing Bretton Woods institution by making Bretton Woods institution more credible and legible. In fact, I uh, worked very closely with John Lipsky, and actually I wasn't that sure, but I was really uh, leading the whole Korean uh, the, uh, G20 endeavor at the time as a, a president's special economic advisor. But in any case, I think this is the key, and the, the global economic order is in flux, and we do need this global uh, order, which will be more the, uh, 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 favorable to continue the global uh, growth and uh, prosperity. But uh, as you mentioned very well, it's quasi impossible for political reasons in the states to reform the IMF right now. So when we see China setting up new banks <coughs> with the BRICS, or, or uh, more lately with the uh, AIIB, um, do, you, do you see it at rival, as rival institutions to the Bretton Woods institutions? Well, personally, I don't think AIB is a rival institution to the Bretton Woods institution. Well, what um, is it then? And also, I hope it will turn out to be rival. And it can be. As to actually, that's what I've been mean, saying in public, in, in, or in China as well. Look at the infrastructure. And, and, yeah, and also, the, the AIIB is for infrastructure investment. It's the role, of IMF is completely, there's no role for right. the monetary uh, policies, macroeconomic policies. Now, look at the, the necessity of infrastructure investment for the global community. According to McKinsey, there are the $57 trillion uh, necessity of investment infrastructure. AIB, you're talking about what? $500 billion at capitalization. Mm -hmm. ADB and World Bank still very, very small. And so this, the, the, AI, the initiation of AIB from this country is a really welcome thing for the global community. Mm -hmm. As long as this institution become complementary and supplementary to the World Bank and an ADB, I hope it should open. Because McKinsey said $57 trillion, which amount to almost a four to five uh, trillion dollars a year, but this is just a necessity. It's not based on feasibility studies and you know this all the profitability studies. So, okay. actual effective demand is much lower, mm -hmm. and therefore the establishment of AIB, AIB or contribution of AIB, not just funding, but the feasibility studies, all the project identification and so forth. So, in on, on that ground, ADB and World Bank has accumulated. Knowledge. So I think they should work together to make the AIB work. And so AIB cannot s succeed mm -hmm. immediately without having this co collaboration. That's why I don't see it as a rival, particularly as I don't see it as a rival institution to Bretton Woods institution, because it doesn't have the function of IMF and the monetary macro policies mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that, that's a very positive view because some have said that it's a way also for the Chinese to exist in new organizations where they didn't have you know, uh, enough, enough space before, and, yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah, they can yeah. grow while ours, yeah. you know, go down. Yeah, I think Chinese, in, in, in their intention, I think they have the ambition, uh, global, mm -hmm. you know, the, the strategic ambition there too, but I, I, I see that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but look, uh, the, look at the IMF uh, current quota distribution. Although China, based on normal exchange rate today, China is about 15% of global economy. U.S. about 24, 25. Mm -hmm. Look at the IMF quota. China is only 4%, and U.S. over or nearly 18%. Mm -hmm. So you know, so what needs to be done is to make China's 
in a voice more heard in this research at the uh, uh, institutions so that the, the China can work with the global community better. That's the way I say it. <laughs> Mr. Ito, I'd be curious to know if you, if you share uh, Mr. Sakong's point of view uh, on, those, uh, on those new institutions coming up, uh, financial institutions led by the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. in Asia. Yeah. Do you agree with him that it's mainly for infrastructure and can be worth for you know, global growth and global economy? Yeah, uh, before I just respond to your question, let me just uh, make a brief. Uh, comment on the, the, the other way. Then I can go over to the China. I think the uh, IMF and the World Bank and uh, GATT, WTO, is still very important. But we have to admit, just the world economy has become much more sophisticated now than when it was established. So when GATT, for example, it's only mostly among the industrial nations for the cutting of tariffs, or mostly on manufactured goods. When we are just, you know, the restricting that area of the discussion, the, the just the business is much easier. Now, IMF, when it was established, was supported by the money from developed countries for the stability of the currency of developed countries. So everything changed in 1973 when the develop, de developed country is changing to the flex exchange rate. Now, we are usually using the money from developed countries more on the stability of developing countries. And so I think that's the role is changing. So although the international institution is very important, we have to some, some more in order to just cope with just, uh, just you know, very immediate uh, issues. So I think the, the, for example, the, uh, the regional tra trade negotiation may be necessary. Uh, someone said just the uh, negotiation itself is very important to just promote the movement in the domestic politics. So when the uh, WTO negotiation is in statement, we have to find some, some, something else to just, uh, you know, uh, agitate. And the, that's what's yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and about the AB, AIAB, I'm not very sure, but we have to remember, uh, we also, also have a huge number of the unilateral uh, contribution of infrastructures by each country. Mm -hmm. Now, China is very big, and uh, you have to remember quite a large portion of money is coming from China. It's, so it's partially the Chinese unilateral action. But China is very you know, skillful to just invite their country to just participate in. So we have to just work very carefully. Every, and everybody the, wants to be there. I mean, a uh, lot yeah. of Occidental countries have decided to put money uh, in the AIB. Yes. And if AIB is very successful to just introduce a very good governance system to check the you know, project and so on, for us, then naturally it can grow more the uh, visible, visible international institution. And if it can't, then it naturally becomes just only unilateral. But it's supposed to be bad news for the Bank of Asian Development, right? Which mm -hmm. is pretty much managed by the Japanese. Well, it's not only Japanese, American and other Asian That's countries. Right, I think this kind of competition is very important anyway, because you know you, you already have to keep changing in just in the face of the, the stability. But the Asian Development Bank has a long tradition of just doing business in a very, you know, in the sophisticated way. So I think just uh, the experience with ADBI, Asian Development Bank, uh, can be used for AIB and so on and so forth. But let me just uh, talk a little bit about more the economic aspects. Uh, sure. Yeah, because the, no, we had a terrorist attack. And uh, it just reminded me of the September 11 uh, terrorist attacks in uh, 2001. And you may remember this is a kind of spreading of a very pessimistic uh, the perspective about the world economy after uh, September 11. Now, the, then came the concept of BRICS. Uh, I think Mr. O'Neill of uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, who just uh, coined the concept, just once told me, he just uh, think the emerging countries' growth is much bigger than the pessimistic you know, picture given by terrorist attack. So that was correct, actually. So we had a very tremendous growth in 2000 to 2008. Now, comparing with that period, now, um, unfortunately, BRICS is now become a rather risk, right. rather than just the, you know, uh, you're taking, the problem. You're taking Brazil so, out and Russia out, so yeah. it doesn't leave much. So we have to just think very seriously about the, this condition, not about terrorists itself, but uh, more the global environment is changing a lot. Now, China maybe uh, will become very important uh, topic in this uh, conference, mm -hmm. uh, is maybe one of the most important players in BRICS. Uh, because of its size and because of its tremendous growth, but at the same time, very importantly, because of the very ultra-Keynesian policy after the Lehman crisis. 
So they spend a lot of money to make investment in infrastructures and uh, heavy industries. And that actually causes a problem much more complicated. The huge amount of the uh, overinvestment on infrastructures and bubbles in real estate market and overlending to state-owned companies or the uh, local government. So uh, China is now correctly changing their direction to so-called new normal. I mean, shifting from manufacturing to service sector, shifting from the investment-led to consumption-led, and going to more modest growth rate. The direction is good, but the problem is, it, I'm not sure whether we can just have a soft landing mm -hmm. to that new normal. And in order to just achieve the new normal growth, it, China is a very dramatic uh, liberalization and privatization of the service sector. But, but what is your bet? Is it a soft landing, or are we all going to suffer well, I think for well, this The market landing? is still watching. I think Rudy Dom should just answer a very interesting comment. Everybody's talking about crisis, mm -hmm. and it never happened. But when crisis happened, it just come very quickly. So maybe 90, maybe 5% uh, is just you know, keeping in a good equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But once there's some kind of a, uh, you know, the, a very bad coincidence, uh, so we have to watch very carefully, uh, but not very pessimistically at this moment. But staying on, on the topic of economics, so we, we noticed that uh, Chinese slowed down. You say that the jury's still out. We don't know if it's going to be a soft or a hard landing. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at Japan, mm -hmm. your country, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's been really three interesting years because since Mr. Abe has been um, elected, mm -hmm. he really tried to impulse a lot of new policies. And the success has not been great. And uh, our, today, Japan is te technically into recession again. Mm -hmm. So can you explain to us why it hasn't <laughs> taken off? I think the, the Japanese experience is not just for Japan. It's a very good uh, case for us to consider about so-called the, the secular stagnation, which was originally discussed by the Larry Summers. So I think the European country is facing a very similar problem, and also the United States and to some degree. I think the, we, what we learn from the 10 years deflation it is very difficult to get out deflation. And we need some very dramatic measures. So I think uh, Mr. Kroder, the governor of Bank of Japan, was very successful, uh, you probably remember, just after a very dramatic measure of monetary policy, the stock price increased 50, 150%, corporate uh, the profit increased more than 30%, and exchange rate moved a lot, and, and, and unemployment rate just become lower to the point of 3.3%. But the problem is, the main body of the economy, such as consumption, uh, investment or the uh, maybe production is very slow to respond because this is much more deep rooted deflation in mind. So what we are now watching in Japan at this moment is a kind of very important transformation from the original uh, first phase of micro expansion to more the you know transmission of the heat to the real economy. I think two things is very important. One is labor market. We are now kind of increasing demand on labor. So if it triggers the increasing wage, that may provide a very good prospect because increasing wage just promotes consumption. And also increasing wage is very important to have a continuing process of the mild inflation. And the other is the investment. Uh, corporate sector just accumulated a huge amount of cash because they are now earning a lot of But problem is they are not using money. So I think, the, again, inflation is very important because then Japan may get into the so-called negative real interest range first time in the last 40 years, which may be very important to promote that kind of action by the corporate sectors. Mm. You say that uh, getting higher wages is important, of course. Uh, getting women in the workforce is another thing that Mr. Abe has been yes. striving for. There again, it's very, very slow. Well, I think the, that's a more the uh, very complicated social problem. Mm -hmm. So the important thing first is very strong political commitment. But we have to also must be very patient, you know, to change the mindset of male you know, for their participation in the family business. And also, we have to change the tax system and everything. But the important thing is Japan, I hope, start moving in that direction. Thank you. I'd like to turn to you, Mr. Monti, now and talk about Europe. Um, in the late, uh, in, the, in regard of the latest crisis uh, Europe is facing, it seems that some European states are at odds uh, and that the march toward a more integrated union is, is kind of fading away. Um, and with the refugee crisis and the terrorist attacks, it seems that the stability pact is, you know, going to be hindered once again. So is it good, do you think, to have that kind of flexibility or or regarding at least the Pact of Stability, or, or the Europeans incurable sinners? 
I believe Europeans are believed by many to be sinners through an excess of virtue. <laughs> really? <laughs> particularly by the Americans and others. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, let me touch uh, briefly on the Stability Pact and then I would like, if you allow me, to resume the discussion on the global economic order or disorder. Uh, I think the Stability Pact is there because it was important to reassure all of the European public opinion that uh, even though there was going to be a single currency, the uh, price stability would be uh, uh, very solid. And we have here the man, Jean-Claude Trichet, who ensured once the single currency was there that indeed that uh, was the case. Uh, now, I uh, like some flexibility, but some limited flexibility to the Stability Pact. For example, the Stability Pact is not an instrument for moral support. So I believe for all the drama that terrorist attacks uh, do imply, for all the enormous responses that that requ requires from a united European Union, I think it's a bit uh, um, improper to say, okay, now you are allowed to use uh, more money for external and internal security, which, was, which is of course an imperative, but uh, the real imperative will be in the end to achieve that through European integrated defense, uh, intelligence, etc. And in the meantime, if uh, that is to be pursued through flexibility in the Stability Pact, what, that, what that, that mean? That individual member states are allowed slash encouraged to finance those greater expenditures in deficit because that is the authorization given by the Stability Pact. But who said that uh, war finance necessarily requires that? Maybe one could consider is this the moment to behave as the grandchildren of Ronald Reagan in some European countries and try to reduce taxes uh, across the board? Or maybe because we are going to need more public goods, like for security, we should give a bit of stop to decline in taxes and provide through uh, taxpayers' money to enhancing citizens, i.e. taxpayers' security. So, but I, I, I am convinced uh, that through the imaginative uh, and painstaking uh, uh, work of the European Union, uh, we may seize this opportunity to revise and to revamp the Stability and Growth Pact by introducing improvements that have nevertheless to do with economics, not with the state of the world globally. And for example, I think this is a good moment to give a more proper, proper and encouraged role to investments, including public investments, in the Stability and Growth Pact, rather than denaturing it to cover non-economic uh, needs that need to be tackled as such by the European Union. But if I may, the discussion was uh, on the decline of multilateral institutions. Uh, and I think this begs the question, what about uh, globalization? Where is it going? My personal view is that globalization is going on as regards uh, technological and business aspects. But uh, globalization has indeed ceased to advance and indeed started to regress as regards the policy and the institutional aspects. We see that at uh, the global level, just think of the WTO and what has been said by my colleagues on the panel. And at the European level, we have seen clear symptoms of integration fatigue well before the economic crisis. So this is not just a side effect of the crisis that people want to integrate less. Just think of the syndrome about the Polish plumbers in uh, France and the Netherlands in 2005. The economies were booming, but there was a willingness to close. Just think even before of the reluctance of 
the uh, corporate uh, community leadership in Europe not to have uh, too much of a bold takeover directive that could open up the market for corporate control in Europe. So, uh, will the march of integration resume when growth is back? I'm not sure at all. And I think uh, the, the more fundamental question is, uh, uh, I, like all, uh, I believe we are proud of our democracies, but there is a gradual degeneration of our national political systems into populism and, uh, let's be frank, into turning the concept of political leadership into political followership. We, are, we don't have political leaders. Now, I'm abstracting from China, which is not normally considered to be a democratic country, but it's a bit of a pity if the democratic countries leave the exclusivity of be willing and be able to take care of the long term only to one country in the world, which is not conventionally considered to be democratic. We specialize in what? Our political leaders specializing in becoming leaders again by winning elections or by doing well in the polls tomorrow. But this transforms them into very skilled followers, not leaders. Now, the, the short-termism that this introduces in, in, in political decision-making is both as regards the time horizon of decisions, who cares about what will happen in five or ten years? Uh, I was in China the other day. They, they have two points in time on which they construct plans. 2021, the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party, and 2049, that they will probably consider the medium term, which is the 100th anniversary of the successful revolution in China. Now, uh, we have the short termism as the time horizon of decision, but also as the time frame of, a, of the debate in our political systems to win the case in debates and eventually to win the elections, you have to present arguments that can be made in 10 seconds. The nationalist, the populist, the protectionist can make these arguments. The country is not growing enough, too much youth unemployment, let's close borders to foreign goods. But to explain the, the virtues of integration, which is just the opposite of that, if you are very good, you need one to two minutes. So you are out. That is why I believe that integration, being the opposite to populism as to the inevitable complexity, is going to lose out. And uh, I would not be surprised if uh, Europe, which is so good under certain emergencies, and it has, uh, I think, dispelled the concerns about Brexit, will probably, I'm convinced, dispel the concerns about Brexit, may well succumb vis-a-vis -vis the disintegration coming not from one country which wants or may be forced to leave, but from within, because the public opinion led or I should say followed by leaders turned populist followers, I'm not ready to proceed with integration. Well, that's something I really feel, you know, hearing this from you, because we would hope that you would be one of our great optimists, and, and actually you're not. So it's uh, I, I uh, kind well, of kind Well, if, of uh, if one uh, understands today. the reason of certain negative phenomena, I think it's a bit of progress, but maybe I'm wrong in the analysis. <laughs> But then again, if, if uh, the U Europe crumbles from the inside, as you say, because of populism mainly, um, where does that lead us? What kind of world, world are we facing then? Uh, and sorry, I mentioned Europe because I'm the only European panel uh, besides uh, the leader of the panel, and we are followers. Oh. But, uh, but with all due respect, uh, maybe the US beats Europe as to domestic populism. 
except that uh, their own political and institutional integration is a bit older than, uh, than ours, so it is not put under discussion every day. So would you like to react to, to uh, Mr. Monti's statement, um, this disintegration from within in Europe and populism rising everywhere, including maybe in the States, we'll see the outcome of the race uh, next year, uh, if, if something good or not <laughs> comes out of it. Mr. Livsky? Well, I'm certainly uh, not the subtle observer of European trends that uh, Mr. Monti is, but uh, I hope that those like himself who have confidence in the initial vision of um, integrating Europe uh, will, will carry the day. Uh, it strikes me that the counterfactual is so unconvincing, namely that Europe would prosper more as a, as a set of more separate, less integrated economies is simply not credible. And one would hope that uh, even in a world of sound bites, that in the end, uh, reason will, uh, will win out. Um, nonetheless, uh, his remark was uh, uh, broader and about the, the US as well. I can't help but saying I find uh, the current status of U.S. political discussion puzzling in the same way, and that it seems that, uh, to, uh, at least for the moment, arguments that seem very hard to defend are, uh, uh, seem ascendant in the polls is a very puzzling one. Uh, but uh, I, at the very least, I'm confident that in the, that, that will not carry the day, and I hope uh, that I'm right. But I would also say that the U.S. has hardly uh, provided a leadership role in the area that I discussed, namely of the reform of the international systems and a defense of the, multilaterals, of the multilateral institutions. Uh, I have been uh, personally disappointed by that and uh, hope that at least it's a temporary phenomenon uh, that will uh, ultimately uh, be reversed and that the U.S. will take a lead, uh, a leadership role once again in helping to st uh, fortify the multilateral institutional system. Uh, just to come back to you for a second, because I was thinking about that while you were speaking. When uh, the Juncker Commission uh, was um, elected and President Juncker took over, his message was much more political. And he said, I want a political commission. And, and her, his first message, I think, was on investment and the need for investment. And that was very loud and, and, and it carried out pretty well until the crisis that we're now going through with the refugees and, uh, and, um, and terrorism. But it seemed that, uh, un I mean, there was hope at the beginning of that commission. It seemed that there was e an eagerness to look forward and to look more midterm than, than maybe we used to. Uh, do you think he can find again that voice despite the actual events and, and try to, to, to pull out a vision for a longer term? I think uh, President Juncker and the Juncker Commission uh, have behaved very well so far not so much because they've been more political, and I will come to that in a second, but because, in my view, they have been having the right vision, they have articulated it well, and they are on the road of uh, implementing what they say. Should we have uh, and be content with uh, a much more political Europe, because the average uh, head of government or minister in European countries will tell you, especially when he or she is under enforcement of some European rules or the stability pact, we need a much more political Europe. Now, I agree that uh, Europe uh, should not be just uh, subjected to rules and automatic mechanisms because that is a bad substitute for political decision-making. But what uh, politics do we need to see more vigorous at the EU level? We have a European Parliament which has a political vision of Europe. We have the European Commission that, as I just said, 
is behaving well in my view now. But what is the place for politics in Europe? That is the European Council, the table of the 28 heads of governments. Now, uh, on average, those meetings are uh, a collection of highly respectable, sometimes even respected national leaders who participate in decision-making about Europe, having what in mind? Their next election. And if their next election is a bit too far, two years, three years, it's not that they exploit that space for wise decisions. No, they will think of how the decision to which they contribute in Brussels that night will impact uh, next week's poll on them uh, and therefore their domestic political situation. So do we want a Europe, in my view the political crisis is Euro, in Europe resides at the level of the national capitals. So uh, I like political leaders who say I want a more political Europe, but provided there is a strong dose of self-examination and uh, coherence. That's very well put. Um, coming back to uh, governments and, and the financial institution, I've been struck uh, about the growing importance of, of the Federal Reserve in the world. I mean, since the crisis, it seems to be really the uh, l'arbitre, I forgot how to say that, but uh, the one who decides what's, what's happening or not. And uh, the fact that the, the QE now is going to probably you know, fade away, a quantitative easing program. Um, what are we to expect? You know, there are a lot of fears uh, about what's going to happen to emerging countries, and I know you're all economists. Can you tell us uh, about what do you think of, of, of that influence the Fed has now on worldwide policies, not only just the United States, it really, really goes beyond? And, and what do you expect of this transition? It will have to make some more very soon uh, to a tightening of its policy. Mr. Ito, maybe? The, uh, we have to just uh, look at not only the United States, but also the world market. As I just mentioned just before, there's a very tremendous shifting of the money to developing countries in 2000. And everybody is, is investing on the emerging countries, resources, and maybe real estate. So I think the Lehman crisis just provided some kind of a turning point to just, uh, just reversing the process and we are still uh, in this kind of busing process. So we have to be very careful. Now, about the action of the Federal Reserve, yes, it's very uh, influential. But at the same time, we have to remember, everybody knows that the Federal Reserve is going to increase interest rate eventually. Mm -hmm. So market is already absorbing uh, the, some kind of expectation of in, in, increasing interest rates. So uh, also, just timing is very important. We ha but I don't have, we, have, we don't have to just overreact to the reaction of the Federal Reserve. Markets are absorbing it, but it can be very brutal nonetheless. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you can have a lot of capital flows just yeah. flying away from mm -hmm. emerging countries. Mr. Sakong, um, about this topic. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, this uh, uh, US, uh, the imminent uh, US Fed's interest rate concerns particularly emerging world because it comes at the time when the Chinese economic slowdown uh, has been uh, uh, the, uh, uh, more uh, visible now. Because uh, Chinese economic slowdown, China is the, the largest importer of uh, the uh, uh, resources, uh, energy, and then the commodities. So those commodity export countries uh, uh, hit by this uh, real economic flow, which is the used through their export rate. And then with Fed interest rate uh, adjustment, they're hit again through financial channel. And the, the capital outflows will be uh, again uh, even accelerated. So altogether, both the real economic flow, the uh, uh, channel, and then the financial channel, these countries, 
uh, will uh, suffer greatly. Of course, so far, it was all expected. Chinese, what is called new normal, is not really not surprising thing. It just cannot, China's growth cannot be sustained. So it's uh, adjusting. So it is already expected. And also U.S. Fed's uh, interest, the uh, hike is also expected. Even then, I think it will hit hard. So again, on this uh, point again, I thought that global economic cooperation is very necessary. And John mentioned that uh, the uh, uh, G20's MAP uh, program, mutual assessment process, these things can be brought in there and could have discussed, at least share information and at least suggest the necessity of policy cooperation and so forth. And there is a means, but it's not utilized in my view. And so I think, I thought this time, and of course because of this terror and everything, but uh, distracted the attention, but I thought the G20 should have dealt more on this because uh, they will have very, uh, the uh, volatile emerging market, uh, the capital market adjustment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now maybe it's a good time to open uh, to questions to the floor. Um, I think we have a mic somewhere, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah, we just need somebody to come over to you with a microphone. With a, I think it's happening. Yes, there are people in the front, please. Oh, she didn't see, okay. Yes, just a moment. So please uh, make your questions short and, and introduce yourself. Thank you, I'm Mel from Israel. My question is uh, to Mr. Lipsky. In 2009, you were suggesting in the IMF that maybe we should change the coin for Federal Reserve and from a dollar to something else. Do you think it's still, again? Yeah, say it again. Okay. In 2009, you were quoted in the IMF that you suggested a possibility to change the coin for the reserve, reservoir of countries from a dollar to a different coin, which is supposed to be the, uh, the ability to draw money from the Federal Reserve. Is, this, is, is it still relevant? this kind of uh, thinking about changing the dollar as a reservoir for countries. Use a different money, is that what you're saying? Not use the dollar anymore? No, no. Uh, today, 70% of the reservoir of countries are hold in dollars, okay? Yeah. Renaud Girard is here to help us. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay? And well, he suggested to change it. Yeah. He suggested to change the, the okay. dollar. So how, the huh? what, what would you expect? You'd like what, to, to see what? Instead of 75, you'd like much less or? He suggested in 2009 to replace the dollar as the coin which used by countries to okay, for hold reserve. Money reserves, is, it, is it still relevant? Is it still relevant, hmm. re relevant to have Let's your see. reserves in dollar? As you can tell, I'm not completely sure that I understand the re the, <laughs> yes. Oui, 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 bien sûr. Voilà. But I could give a, we could start with a formal answer. There is an agreement within the IMF that ultimately the, uh, the international system will be based on the SDR as the principal reserve currency. Uh, yes. Uh, this doesn't seem to be pursued with any, uh, with any great uh, alacrity. Uh, nonetheless, uh, certainly, as you, you've all seen, uh, and if the, the reference was to the uh, suggestion by Governor Joe of the uh, People's Bank of China, that uh, ultimately that the uh, RMB, that the Chinese currency, become an international reserve currency, that has certainly uh, progressed substantially and will take a, take a, a leap forward, if you will. Uh, with if the membership of the IMF carry through the recommendation of the IMF staff that was issued last week to include the Chinese currency in the uh, currency basket of the special drawing writer SDR uh, or the reserve asset created by, by the IMF. Uh, the practical implications, immediate practical implications of such a decision are relatively limited, but they do open the way uh, in light of the uh, measures that have been taken by the Chinese authorities and, and are planned for the future to continue opening their capital account and 
modernizing and strengthening their domestic financial system, uh, certainly the use of the Chinese currency in, uh, in the international system is uh, likely to grow. Uh, whether that supplants the uh, dollar is another, and how soon is another question. Broad rule of thumb for, for reserve currencies is that a country should maintain its reserve balance more or less in order, on the same order of the percentage of their international trade denominated in that currency plus their international debt denominated in that currency. And in those terms, uh, today the, the dollar is not overused, it's, it, its uh, role in reserves is essentially in line with that broad rule of thumb. Uh, whether that changes in the future is going to be another question, and certainly the creation of a viable alternative in the Chinese currency uh, could influence that, that over time. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, what makes the system work is the confidence in the uh, coherence and consistency of economic and monetary policy of the principal authorities, and uh, uh, not just the Fed. And that is, is certainly one of the goals of the G20 process, to, en to enhance both the reality and the perception that policies are being adopted in a coherent and consistent way. And I think that is a goal that is yet to be achieved. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, somebody behind you needed the, do you have the microphone? Merci. <coughs> Monsieur Leishoubi, uh, ancien ministre uh, algérien et académicien. Je développais pour ma part un certain nombre de questions et de craintes qui ne sont pas du tout levées à, à travers les, les différents euh, intervenants. La, la remarque, c'est que les grandes questions mondiales ont l'air d'être managées et gérées de façon parallèle, c'est-à-dire euh, avec quelques étanchéités. Quand on prend la question du climat, la problématique, la dynamique au sein des spécialistes est totalement différente de la prise en charge par les politiques et encore plus par les opinions. Sur le plan de l'économie, c'est la même chose. Le marché euh, se gère en parallèle, euh, en totale euh, différence de rythme et d'appréhension. Les grands groupes industriels, c'est la même chose. Les finances, les institutions multilatérales, euh, on les dit dans le déclin, c'est-à-dire incapables d'influencer le cours euh, politique des, des choses. Et, et on peut continuer avec euh, l'autonomie des banques centrales, les visions, etc. Et donc, euh, la première conclusion, est-ce qu'il n'y aurait pas une sorte d'incapacité des, des politiques qui a été fabriquée par euh, un modèle, par une machinerie qui a développé sans arrêt des étanchéités Et du coup, la question qui se pose, est-ce qu'il n'y aurait pas euh, ce lien politique entre l'opinion, entre le décideur politique et euh, le gestionnaire et le spécialiste qui le liant, c'est-à-dire la pensée politique qui a l'habitude d'organiser tout ça, d'éviter que le système agisse et évolue en rupture totale et en incompréhension euh, euh, majeure. Et, et donc, euh, ma question, est-ce que les opinions, est-ce que les politiques ne sont pas au fur et à mesure désarmées conceptuellement euh, on arrive de moins en moins à lire le monde, à lire euh, l'autre. Et ma dernière question, est-ce que vous n'avez pas le sentiment que les économistes euh, technicistes, et je le dis sans vision euh, négative, n'ont-ils pas supplanté le politique avec un, 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 un élément, je veux dire, un, euh, négatif euh, sur les impacts Et est-ce que le profil du politique lui-même n'a pas changé Merci. Uh, it seems that Mr. Monti, you, you did address this. Uh, did you want to come back to, to this question? Well, thank you for this privilege. I thought that a negative conflict of competence might arise <laughs> on uh, who was the member of the panel uh, explicitly addressed <laughs> by this question. Uh, what I did was take note of the different uh, sides of this fascinating prism that you presented uh, to us. Incapacité de politique, les politiques désarmées, les économistes n'ont-ils pas supplanté les politiques? 
je crois que l'aspect le plus important de votre question complexe est que il faudrait une synergie qui peut-être aujourd'hui n'est pas tellement là. Et, et si les politiques sont désarmées, je vous suggère en retour de considérer aussi le auto-désarmement qu'ils sont en train de s'infliger dans cette euh, course au court terme, dans la tonalité de gestion de leur pouvoir. Et je ne suis pas convaincu que les économistes aient beaucoup amplifié et agrandi leur rôle, mais ici je suis entouré par des véritables économistes auxquels, à ce point-ci, je me permets, si vous le permettez, madame, de passer la parole. Uh, maybe Mr. Sakmon, because he's an economist. I mean, you're an economist, and you're, you, you were a politician, too. The fact that uh, there is less and less political will expressed, that uh, you can't integrate all the, the different pieces together. Uh, by the way, I wasn't a politician. <laughs> I well, was you were more Minister of, of Finance. Uh, yeah, yes, I was more a technocrat, yes. Uh, yeah, so you were uh, one of those, yeah. But I think we live in a very, very complicated, interdependent world, and therefore the, uh, you do need uh, technocrats and, uh, and the uh, uh, economists who can push things in a more the the macroeconomic uh, the uh, framework and and so economists are trained to do that and then the decision is up to the politicians to make this but the options should be provide presented to the uh, decision makers and uh, I think uh, uh, you know <coughs> the the for example in China in my view there are so many uh, so-called uh, China pessimists who are saying that they're imminent to have uh, the hard lending instead of soft lending of uh, around 6% or so. But based on my, my <coughs> view is that based on my conversations with senior policymakers and the technocrats there, I am on the more on the optimistic side than pessimistic, pessimistic side because they seem to know what they are doing and their problems, they do know the problems. And so I think they communicate with the uh, party leaders and the politicians. So do you, you do need these uh, the, uh, uh, good advices uh, provided by the economists? So I think there is a, a usefulness of economists, the role of economists. But uh, of course, it's again, uh, they have to be persuasive enough to persuade the politicians. But politicians do need uh, economists' advice. That's the way I would then uh, uh, okay, respond to that. Thank you for this. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Gérard, une question? Uh, oui, Renaud uh, Gérard. Ça marche, ça? Oui. Je suis le chroniqueur international du Figaro. Euh, nous avons parlé de, de la monnaie. Je voudrais maintenant parler un peu du commerce international, des échanges, mais qui est une session qui euh, sera un peu consacrée à ce sujet. Est-ce que vous pensez que euh, les échanges, et cette question se pose à vous quatre, est-ce que les échanges économiques mondiaux peuvent se poursuivre, les échanges de biens et services, alors que les conditions de production, et je parle bien sûr des... Euh, des conditions sociales, par exemple, euh, ne sont pas du tout harmonisées. Euh, elles ne sont même pas harmonisées en Europe. Et elles ne sont pas harmonisées dans le monde. Donc, est-ce que euh, on va continuer à avoir de plus en plus euh, de libre échange avec euh, des différences sociales énormes entre les pays, ou est-ce que, euh, on, selon vous, on se rapproche d'une situation où le protectionnisme va être rétabli, par exemple au sein de l'espace européen, de manière à euh, être compétitif par rapport au continent, 
si on parle de l'Europe, qui n'ont pas les mêmes critères de production et les mêmes protections sociales que l'Europe. Uh, I'm just talking about just our experience in Asia, uh, which may be very different from what happened in, United, in Europe. Uh, in economics, we have a kind of concept of gravity model, where the shorter the distance, there's going to be more trade between the two countries, and the size of two countries are so important to increase the trade. Now, in the case of Europe, you have already many big countries with short distance, so you have tremendous amount of intra-European trade. But in Asia, uh, because just recent growth of the, you know, the income in Asian countries, we are now trying to just capture the opportunity of increasing trade among us, uh, which act actually provides a lot of opportunity for the, our neighboring countries to just upgrade their working condition and just upgrade their li living standard. And also, I think the, the population aging in developing, developed nations, especially in the case of Asia, like Japan, it's very, very important issues to just reflect in the type of trade we are going to have in the future. So there's a lot of complementarity among the countries in this region to just get the benefit from this kind of trade. And of course, we have to do a lot of uh, the political and institutional uh, adjustment to just get rid of some kind of friction we may have. But generally, I think the, uh, we're going to have more opportunity of increasing the number of trade and investment in the region. And I don't know about the European case, but uh, at least in the Asia, yes. Mr. Monti? Uh, oui, je crois, monsieur, que ce que vous uh, imaginez est uh, pas uh, une démarche vers un protectionnisme uh, non coordonné et néfaste. Peut-être vous Euh, ce que vous avez à l'esprit est la nécessité d'une plus grande homogénéité entre les conditions sociales, environnementales, etc. C'est un peu une position française euh, qui, qui est là depuis un certain temps et, qui, euh, et que je souhaiterais résumer dans l'expression « En Europe, il faut un marché » unique, bien sûr, ouvert, bien sûr, mais pas désarmé. Donc, euh, il faut que l'Europe ait une capacité de réaction euh, pour ne pas être le territoire de conquête de la part des producteurs d'autres pays qui euh, produisent dans des conditions non comparables aux nôtres. On peut discuter longuement sur cette euh, vue, mais ce que je crains peut-être est qu'aujourd'hui, euh, il y ait le risque d'un protectionnisme à l'intérieur même de l'Union européenne, pays entre pays de l'Union européenne, et, et, euh, et d'une façon... Euh, non géré, non coordonné, euh, ce qui semble être un risque réel si nous euh, voyons les euh, réactions euh, instinctives euh, primordiales que beaucoup de euh, partis et mouvements nationalistes et populistes, presque dans chacun de nos États membres, manifestent. Et euh, c'est un peu dans, ce, dans cette catégorie de réaction instinctive, je crois, euh, ce phénomène qui m'a beaucoup, beaucoup choqué récemment que dans le pays qui a été le plus demandeur en Europe de la création d'une monnaie unique, donc la France, parce qu'il ne faut pas penser que ça a été l'Allemagne à demander une monnaie unique. Nous savons bien que c'était juste le contraire. Et donc, euh, on a, avant les élections européennes de 2014, on a assisté en France à des débats dans lesquels on semblait avoir complètement oublié que c'était la France qui avait demandé la monnaie unique. Et, et donc, et, et il y avait 
dans, dans beaucoup de milieux français, euh, un sentiment d'aliénation, de lack of ownership et de désir de fuite de, ce, de cet espace monétaire unique, comme on pourrait, euh, comme on aurait pu l'entendre ces temps-là à Lisbonne ou, ou à Athènes. Donc c'est un peu dans cette euh, perspective pas tellement rationaliste et de réaction instinctive, maintenant je fais référer à, à l'appartenance à la monnaie unique ou pas, que je crains que des, euh, des impulsions protectionnistes ne peuvent se produire à l'intérieur même de l'Union européenne. Mr. Lipsky, and then I saw two more questions. It's, we're really uh, finishing up now, so let's do this quickly. <laughs> Points. Uh, first, in response, the, the, uh, uh, I recall a few years ago, uh, Nobel laureate Michael Spence headed something called the Commission on Growth and Development that, uh, without going into greater detail, concluded, uh, I thought, definitively, there is no case of a country successfully developing their economy uh, without linkage to the, to the global, to global markets. There, and if Europe were to engage in a process of closing itself off, I would become much more pessimistic about the outlook. To the contrary, there is a large challenge before Europe and an opportunity, and that is the so-called TTIP negotiations with the United States that holds out the, pro the prospect of changing a unifying uh, standards in, in broad areas of the economy that would produce mutual efficiency gains that would demonstrate international leadership and that ultimately would benefit uh, the process of global integration and, uh, and global development. Uh, I worry that on both sides of the Atlantic, so far there has been, at the political level, a lack of sufficient engagement to make people aware of what's at stake and to sell what is potentially an extremely powerful and positive development. Thank you. Uh, I know we're, we're over time. Um, there were one, two questions. I don't know if we can still make it. So, no, you're okay? Okay, so just this gentleman and, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Manaf Al Hajri. I'm from Kuwait, from the private sector. My question goes to Mr. Lipsky and Mr. Monty, both. Um, I would like to address the issue of uh, institutional excellence or reforming institutions. Um, uh, whether it's the G20 or the IMF, um, the one, one feels that institutions can, of course, be public sector or private sector. There is a dispro disproportionate effort in terms of addressing the governance of private sector as opposed to the public sector. Nevertheless, in the Middle East, for instance, the, 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 the public apparatus is disproportionately more important. It is the largest employer. It is a, a tremendous way of introducing social justice, and it is the largest employer. What we're seeing now is that none of the G20 or the IMF are effective enough. The IMF, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, has been reduced to giving advice competing with private sector consultants and unwittingly uh, giving certain legitimacy for the wrong agendas. Going to the G20, at, 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 the, at the mission statement level, we hear great things in terms of uh, institutional excellence. However, when we go to the individual country levels, I'm talking about European countries, there is a sense of competition between the, the different countries because we feel that the, the, private for, uh, the private market forces prevail. Sometimes most of the visitations that we see in the Middle East by ministers, most of the agendas of the ambassadors are pure commerce driven. They are, they are more geared to promoting export and never do we or rarely do we hear things about the things that have to do with institutional excellence that we hear about at the G20 level. Thank you. So the lack of coherence. You are the global man. I guess. Uh, look, the the uh, the challenge of of institutional excellence is uh, one that transcends public and private uh, institutions, and there's no uh, no easy and magic answer. Uh, 
two things about the, about the IMF. First of all, that I think it's uh, not, not so recognized. It has a unique governance structure in that uh, the, uh, the Constitution, the Articles of Agreement, say that voting shares, i.e. weight in governance, should be governed by economic weight and that that economic weight should be reassessed at a minimum every five years. Think of the long-term goal. The long-term goal is the equalization of uh, per capita incomes around the world. If that happens, if that goal were to be uh, uh, achieved, then by definition, over time, the IMF's governance would become perfectly democratic. If in the, in the extreme, per capita incomes were equalized around the world. So it's a very interesting institution, it's a unique international institution, that the internal mechanism would point to increasing de democ democratization over time if it succeeds uh, in its goals. Uh, but also the fund has something called the, uh, uh, the in internal uh, uh, evaluation office, excuse me, the internal, the IEO, uh, which is a, uh, a body that's, that reports to the membership, the, the executive board, that attempts exactly to do what you want them to do, which is to look back, to look at the processes of the fund and help provide an ongoing commentary driving toward intellectual, in, in institutional excellence. The G20, of course, is a very complex uh, uh, challenge. How to make a voluntary intergovernmental organization become effective. Here, political leadership is, is uh, absolutely crucial. And now I defer to Mario Monti. I, I entirely agree with, uh, with John. Uh, political leadership becomes crucial in the G20, like in the G7 or 8. Uh, but then what I think we have observed concerning these more voluntary, informal, and yet useful fora such as the G8 or the G20 is that uh, their effectiveness depends, A, on political leadership, but also very much on, B, the degree of emergency which is existing. And I think we can say that uh, the first G20s uh, in the US and then in London just after the crisis uh, were taken more seriously in terms of subsequent implementation than, uh, than uh, uh, was the case a bit later when the crisis was not so visible. This is a normal human reaction that is uh, there. And because I've been rather critical of the European Union this morning, I'd like to close with a fairly positive comment in this respect of the European Union. Unlike the G20, the European Union has a, a set of rules, of institutional arrangements, etc., etc., which uh, introduce more slowness in decision-making, but also have the advantage of introducing a bit more of permanence so that decisions taken under the pressure of emergency, once they become directives, regulations or whatever of the European Union, they are there. There will be an enforcement process. So there are the advantages there of being an institution with uh, a supranational enforcement power that I'm afraid is not there with the G20. Okay, well, thank you very much. So more linkage and more long-term political, political vision will seem to be a necessity to have more effective governance. Thank you very much, and I think it's time for the coffee break.